And welcome to the um, session today, uh, which is uh, uh, on uh, uh, multi-messenger astrophysics and cosmology and space science. Uh, I can see on the program uh, a lot of uh, uh, cosmic messengers. Uh, we start uh, with uh, uh, photons, uh, in particular high-energy photons with rasmic Mizonian, gamma ray, and multi-messenger highlights uh, with magic. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think I'm having some problem with my computer. Excuse me for one minute. <coughs> so I think I'm, I'm ready with my presentation. So I'm, I'm going to talk today about uh, gamma ray and multi-messenger highlights of the MAGIC telescope project. Some of you may know what is MAGIC, but uh, those of you who don't know, I think uh, I will try to give a good impression about it. So, um, in 19, 1937, Pavel Cherenkov succeeded measuring the anisotropy of the induced by charged particles light emission in liquids. And I think uh, in 1934-37, uh, he performed an um, excellent series of experiments uh, finding out the main features of this emission. This emission later on, I think, uh, carried his name. Today we, we refer to it as Cherenkov emission. So um, while the Cherenkov emission was known in uh, liquids since 1926, when the German scientist Mallet was experimenting with it, and then he published three papers in the three consequent years, 1926-29, in gases it was known, not known, and I think uh, it took quite, quite some time until it became known. And um, um, the first uh, experimental mention was uh, from Kelbright and Jelly, who tried to find out if there is Cherenkov emission in the atmosphere. So they, they took a um, garbage bin, fixed a 60 centimeter mirror inside, and um, a photomultiplier in the focus of this uh, concave mirror and they, they were measuring something like eight pulses per hour, and this is the birthday of uh, measuring Cherenkov emission in atmosphere. So this was 1953, and then coming back to today, I think there are three leading instruments. These are Veritas, Hess, and Magic, we are, which are pushing the very high energy gamma ray astrophysics to its limits. On this figure, you can see the Veritas telescopes array, it, uh, these are four telescopes of 12 meter diameter in Arizona. A similar array exists in Namibia. Um, this is operated by the HES collaboration. In the center, you see this gigantic 28 meter diameter telescope, plus four telescopes of 12 meter diameter. And then you can see these two magic telescopes, which we are operating on Canary Island of La Palma. The observation height is 2,200 meters. It is the Roque de los Muchachos uh, European North Observatory. So, I, talking about magic, I, I want to say that it's a real high-tech telescope, and then we are using a number of innovations in this telescope, like a carbon fiber frame of the telescope. This is used for lightweight and stiffness. Um, we are adjusting our mirrors in active way. Every mirror is sitting on two stepping motors and is under computer control. We can direct the telescope to anywhere in the sky within 20 seconds when alert will come. Then we are transferring our analog signals via optical fibers. So in this way, we keep the very fast signal without degradation, any degradation in time. Um, then uh, we are using special hemispherical PMTs developed for our purposes special guide lights. Um, we have an active temperature control in the camera by circulating a coolant in a closed loop. And in this way, we achieve a temperature stabilization within, within the camera, plus minus one degree in centigrade. We have some pop-up target, which is popping up, and we adjust our mirrors, or we measure just one, taking one shot of a CCD camera, we can measure reflectivity of our mirrors. So I think there are a lot of innovative things. And then I, I should say that it took us uh, quite some time because of this complexity. Uh, we were polishing these novel technologies. And this was necessary step 
for um, going into very low energies. And then the main purpose of magic telescopes, it's a pioneering telescope. This pioneering telescope idea, the first idea was formed sometime in 1994, was to build an instrument which can go in the energy domain, measuring in the energy domain below 200 GV. And then today we can do measurements uh, above 25 GV, 30 GV. I think you will learn more about this. So this is one of the view graphs where you can see laser point has attached to every single mirror of magic, which is under uh, computer control. We, we adjust the lasers in such a way that uh, they show the same direction where the mirror is re reflecting light. Um, I just like this picture, therefore I show you. So these are the two telescopes. These are 17 meter diameter telescopes with a focus of 17 meters. And th these two telescopes are separated by, 17, uh, by 85 meters. Uh, this is um, approximately F1 optics. And then um, every telescope has a mirror surface area of about 240 square meters. This is another view of the experimental site. It's a relatively old uh, picture from 10, 10 years old. Uh, in the middle, you see this uh, so-called counting house where the electrical signals are arriving via optical fibers. We convert them back to, into um, the optical signals into electrical ones, and we process everything there. And this is where our data first time get processed. So the telescopes are producing one terabyte of data per telescope per night. So in the morning, we have a nice two terabytes to process. Uh, during the existing time of magic, I think uh, we were always um, um, bringing in innovations into the project, enhancing its sensitivity. And then on this view graph, you can see sensitivity development, hence from the beginning of the project, when there was just a single telescope. It is shown in gray dots, uh, gray circles. And later on, I think uh, we changed the measurement to so-called uh, multiplexer uh, version, where uh, two giga sample readout system was built in. And then uh, since two, 2009, we are operating two telescopes. We built the second telescope, put it into operation. And the red curve is showing uh, sensitivity of our telescopes. And then there is a pink dot somewhere higher up. It's about uh, 50 GV. This is showing the sensitivity there, but I will do a little bit more about it. And uh, I will introduce you some techniques, uh, which uh, recently I think uh, uh, we started operating, which increased the sensitivity of project uh, even further. I do not have the exact curve of sensitivity, but uh, just as a cartoon, I show you improvements at the lowest energies and at the highest energies. So I think uh, in our project, uh, we are a big fan of uh, Crab Nebula and Crab Pulsar because this is the best studied object in the sky um, after sun. And I think it has been measured in all wavelengths multiple times. It is measured uh, for some instruments at the calibration source, not for everyone, <laughs> as we learned. And then uh, we always try to find some aspects of this telescope. And then um, I think uh, I will show you some, uh, some facets which we try to measure. And then, um, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see a um, list of papers where we were step-by-step um, step solving the puzzle about Crab Pulsar. And then the first uh, step was made already 10 years ago when unexpectedly we found gamma ray pulses from the Crab Pulsar for energies above 25 GV. And then this uh, story continued. Then it 25 GV turned out to be also 100 GV. Then I think our colleagues from Veritas measured the signal within uh, even higher energies until 250 GV. And then I think we, we measured further 400 GV. Then I think we found this uh, bridge emission from the crop pulsar. And I think uh, recently we published a paper where we saw pulsations till 2 TV, something very absolutely unexpected because if some of you may remember, the Egret satellite was claiming something like 15 years ago, crab pulsar spectrum is tailing off at above 6 GV. Now I'm talking about 2 TV. 
So I think this is a simple cartoon of a, a crab pulsar, and then I think the pulsar is in the center. Uh, pulsar size is something like the size of a Rome, probably. Um, it has a mechanical rotation axis shown in pink color, and it has a, a magnetic rotation axis shown with B, and they make some angle. And then by looking to the topology of this object, uh, for the crab pulsar, I think uh, it rotates about uh, it rotates 30 times per second. Um, it's very interesting because of the rotating magnetic field. It is inducing electrical field, which is enormously high. It is on the level of 10 to the 16 power volts. And then uh, it's such a high power that it can peel off the charge carriers from the surface of the pulsar. This force is uh, four orders of magnitude higher than the enormous force of gravitation for the pulsar. And under certain conditions, there is a charge flowing <coughs> in the magnetosphere of pulsar. It has an um, enormous magnet uh, magnetic field on the order of 10 to the 12 Gauss. And then there is a component of electrical field which is parallel to magnetic field. And in that, in that region, some acceleration may take place. And then um, I think there are a few scenarios how this acceleration can work. And then you can see some um, conditionally some scenarios are shown. This is the polar cap. I think a polar cap, uh, from the polar cap, I think emission may stem, or from the outer gap, or, or there are other, um, um, other models. And then one by one, we were looking into this. And uh, this is the first paper that I'm referring to, 2008. Um, I think uh, 20, uh, uh, gamma rays of 25 GB and higher have been found. And what is interesting, I think this model killed the polar cap model for the crab pulsar. So people started looking for other models. This is another measurement uh, performed with the magic stereo system. And then we measured a relatively strong signal. And then, as you can see, very, we very clearly could separate phase one signal and phase two signal. Phase one signal is at zero, and the phase two signal is centered at 0 0.4. And the picture is repeated just for improved uh, readability, visibility. So um, we, can, we saw that the second pulse at 0 0.4 is uh, much stronger, much intense. And what is interesting, I think uh, this measurement uh, strongly questioned the outer gap model. So I think uh, we were doing measurements, and then Theory people were developing their models, and then the, the only question was who was faster. But the models were changing very fast, I should tell you. So the next step, I think we found the so-called bridge emission. You see the two pulses, P1, P2. In between, there is this bridge emission. And then I think uh, this bridge emission is hinting on a toroidal bending of magnetic lines near light cylinder because most things in the pulsar atmosphere happen around light cylinder. Light cylinder is an imaginary place where embedded particles in the magnetosphere are accelerated due to centrifugal force to the speed of light. And then I think uh, at light cylinder, major changes of magnetic field behavior is happening. As you can imagine, uh, it cannot in the same way the dipole accelerate particles. So in a very fancy way, they are twisting and coming back. So <clears throat> with this series of measurements, qualitative description of crab pulsar emission belongs to the past. So now we need models which can be tested against precision experimental data. This is another measurement um, where we put together about uh, 320 hours of data taken in different times, good quality data. We had much more data. And then we could very clearly measure pulsations at energies above 400 GV. And then pulse two was the stronger one, at zero, phase 0 0.4. And we saw that the pulse two emission is stretching until two tera electron volts. And then uh, it became very clear very soon that curvature radiation alone cannot explain these high energies. Curvature radiation typically will accelerate something like in the GV region. If you stretch it very much, you may go to 100, 150 GV, but uh, TV is excluded. So inverse, ca inverse Compton, Compton scattering is the mechanism which can produce those high energy pulses. 
And then I think uh, this is where, uh, with the help of theorists, we um, parted, um, produced a model uh, trying to um, explain this data. Here you can see the spectrum. The spectrum measured uh, by magic is matched with the spectrum measured by Fermi, Fermi LAT. And then you can see that the spectrum of magic is described by power law. And uh, phase one pulse is stretching till almost one TV, a little bit less. Phase two, almost two TV. And uh, this is a clear sign of uh, inverse Compton mechanism working. And what is remarkable, we do not see cutoff here. We just run out of statistics. So if there were more data, probably we are going to measure even higher energies. We may come back to this in future. So we, we developed new um, technique, so-called some trigger technique. The original idea stems from Oki de Yaga long ago, but we have modified this idea. And my colleagues, led by Thomas Schweitzer, I think uh, made in special electronics where from the usual three next neighbor pixel trigger per telescope, we moved to uh, triggering on uh, patches in the camera, which includes something like 19 pixels, but a very low level, that's a even single photoelectrons will play a role. And then we take these signals and we cut their head. We must cut the head of the signals, otherwise the negative effect called after pulsing in PMTs will not allow to do this. But after that, we sum up all the outputs and we set a total threshold of something like 27 photoelectrons. So this is now seems to successfully work. And uh, this is our standard trigger. And then the peak of this distribution is about 40 C 47 GV. This is for three next neighbor uh, trigger. And with some trigger, when we are operating some trigger, we go down to 30 GV. But as you can see, we can do measurements also on the left side of the peak, so going below 30 GV. Um, I think there were a lot of interesting uh, studies done with this data, and then uh, this is an interesting view graph. On the x-axis, you, you can see the phase, and the y-axis, you, you can see the energy, and then you can see that uh, when you go to um, higher and higher energies, this is Fermi range. The upper one is magic. The pulses become narrow and narrow. Phases become narrow and narrow. Very interesting feature, uh, which could be essentially for leaf studies. And uh, we did such a study. Um, I should mention that because of this large variety of uh, results, I, I decided to give you an impression just about few results. It doesn't make sense that I list you a lot of name and try to impress you. I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to concentrate on a few results. And then if I can give you an impression what we are doing, um, I would think that I succeed in doing that. So I think we, we continue measuring uh, Crab Nebula. And on this view graph, you can see that uh, we started measuring uh, the spectral energy distribution starting at about 30 GV. This is unpublished data yet, but uh, soon I think it will flow into publication. And uh, this is uh, data taken with this novel sum trigger. And uh, we can show pulsation starting from 30 GV from Crab Pulsar. We have data even for lower energies. Um, uh, they need to be confirmed. Typically, we never show um, any signal which is analyzed by single person or two persons. In critical cases, we involve three, four people who in independent locations are confirming analysis. Just to tell you, I think, this difference. So this is our data of 10 years ago when we measured um, pulsations from the crab pulsar, and uh, this was our sensitivity. Uh, we, we were able to measure 1.4 sigma from in a square root of hours. So in uh, roughly, in term, let's say, in 15 hours, you will measure 5 sigma. And this sensitivity, it has been increased to 2.3 um, 2 sigma in a square root of hours. 
so we can measure signal from the crop pulsar essentially in something like five hours. I would like to talk a little bit about Gamingo pulsar. Um, it's very different from uh, crop pulsar because it is much older, it's 340,000 years old, while the crop pulsar, as you well know, is just 1,000 years old. Geminga is very nearby, the distance is just 150 p.m. parsec, while crab is at 2,000 parsec. Um, e dot for Geminga is three times 10 to the 34 eggs per second, and uh, for crab pulsar it is four orders of magnitude higher. And uh, Fermi Lat seem to uh, observe pulsations for energies above 10 GV, and then um, there is a hint that maybe the behavior of this uh, high energy pulsation deviates from the exponential cutoff. So here we report that uh, we succeed to observe Gaming Pulsar with Magic Telescope. This is the first uh, international conference where we report about it. We have a significant signal from the object. And now we are working, uh, I think uh, we are working on the spectrum, trying to understand in which regime do we measure if there is um, power low tail, uh, like it was the case with the crop pulsar. Um, pulsars at very high energies measured by imaging atmospheric sharing of telescopes. So along with crop pulsar measured by magic and Vela pulsar measured by Hess, Gemenga is uh, essentially on the third pulsar detected in the very high energy regime. And we need to understand a lot about this complex interplay between the energetics, cutoffs, acceleration mechanisms, spectrum behavior, viewing angle, angle between the rotation magnetic axis. Pulsars are very complex objects. So in the coming years, uh, we will be exploiting, uh, exploring these um, pulsars uh, intense, very, very intensively. And then I would say that the pulsar hunt with the uh, imaging channel of telescopes going down to 20 GV and up to multiple TV energies has just started. I want to introduce you another technique which, which is giving a kind of a second life to magic. This is, these are the very large zenith angle observations. Typically when a shower is coming from zenith, a small zenith angle, it is illuminating an area of about 300 meter uh, in diameter on the ground. But if you go to a large zenith angle, situation is changing. And then I think the shower develops much, much further away from you. And therefore, it is illuminating much larger area. So this area is not anymore 300 meter, but let's say it is three, five kilometer. Because of it, you can collect much more many air showers, albeit at higher energies, because photon density will be lower. So we are exploring this. And the best example, convincing example, is uh, this picture is taken from the um, Roque de los Muchachos site, sunset. This is the ocean. And then the sun is just setting there. I think it's touching 90 degrees in the horizon. And then with the spectrograph, I measured the spectrum of the sun at about 65 degrees, then 87 degrees, 88 degrees, 89 degrees, 89.9 degrees. And what you can see, there is still some light arriving between 500 nanometers and let's say 650 nanometers. And this light can be, you can measure, I think, because this is speaking about Cherenkov light. So we, we took an effort, I think last three years, to measure um, sources at the large zenith angles. Of course, I think because uh, the source is much further away, you need an advanced method for calibration, but we developed these methods and uh, we check them, and then we have two methods, I think, uh, or three, I should say. I think uh, the situation is well our, under our control. So what is happening at this very large zenith angle observations? I think you can see the collection area for the telescopes, and this uh, dashed line shows one kilometer square. And then in the moment when you go to, towards 80 degrees, I think you see that your collection area is becoming about two kilometers square. Uh, I should mention that typically collection area of a Cherenkov telescope from Zenit for single telescope is just 50,000 square meters. So it's a factor 40 times higher compared to normal. And uh, just to bring your attention, a spectrum, a spectrum, a recently measured spectrum of the Crab Nebula, 
And then these are these red dots. We compare it with the Hegra measurements. And then um, they are very compatible. I think the last energy point somewhere here, what we show is about 100 TV. And then I want to say uh, that uh, these statistics we have collected about eight times faster than Hegra because Hegra was measuring 400 hours and we have this data just in 50 hours. So we are working on this and then we are measuring also other sources. And as you can imagine, we are having a plan to chase uh, pevatrons. So going to almost to horizon, I think, is increasing the area very much. I think we, are, uh, we have a very strong uh, extragalactic uh, um, uh, observation program. And then if you look to this uh, cartoon, you can see what redshift sources uh, did we measure. I think the sor no, sources are stretch until a redshift of one. And then we measure blazers, radio galaxies, cipher galaxies. I, I will mention some, some of them. Uh, I think this is about flat spectrum radio quasars. And these are the most luminous sources um, of uh, aging um, class. Um, and, this, um, and they have very, very high Doppler factors, not in the jet. And then optical spectrum of uh, flat spectrum radio quasar shows the broad emission lines. And then a spectral energy distribution, it has a low synchrotron peak frequencies, which is very convenient for Fermi satellite. But if you have sensitive telescope, you can do that. And from the eight, source, eight known sources, I think six has been discovered by magic. Um, I have not much time to talk about it, but I will mention just one. This PAX 1441 measured a few, few years back. And then you learn very much about uh, how flat spectrum radio quasar is working because there is this um, 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 broad line region uh, where the gammas cannot come out. And then if you measure gammas, then I think uh, emission region must be beyond, uh, must be above the broad, uh, broad line region. And this is what we observed with this source. We had a very strong signal and then we saw that after six days, suddenly uh, the source stopped and then we conclude that the source went down. Um, I think uh, something very interesting, just uh, to flash one slide, uh, we seem to measure some line feature in the spectrum. This is the first time in the several TV range. Um, it is from Markham 501. This line we observed for, for duration of a couple of days. And then we had a similar measurement uh, something like seven years back in time. We are looking at what this could mean. Uh, as of now, the significance of the trial is not very high, but it uh, seems that we are dealing with a real feature. So if this confirmed, uh, this will be something new at very high energies. We have an intense uh, dark matter program, and then um, essentially during this last year, uh, we improved by three orders of magnitude uh, our uh, limits. Um, I think it's a special topic for itself. But uh, I would like to say something about MAGIC uh, transient program. So we have an intense program on uh, gamma ray uh, GRBs, gravitational waves, neutrinos, faster radio bursts, NOVA, uh, et cetera. We have a fully automatic alert system for our telescope. So when an alert is coming, um, there is no interaction whatsoever from human. I think the telescope is uh, closing the current f files. I think and then it, uh, it in very high speed is moving to to the alert position and then starting measuring there. In the meantime, while moving, it takes something like 20 seconds. It is uh, measuring the pedestals, it is measuring the calibration, it, it does uh, laser calibration, and then it is uh, downloading the um, lookup tables for the mirror adjustment for a particular direction. So I think typically we manage it in 20, 25 seconds. And these are the GRBs that we were measuring over many years. And then this is the redshift distribution. Redshift one is here, two, three, four. Typically, we, can, we hope to measure until redshift one. So we, we are getting something like eight to 10 GRBs and then did not manage to measure any significant signal. But in one case, in the case of this famous GRB from um, August 21st, 2016, we have some small signal there. And my, maybe one can talk about a hint, weak hint there. Uh, we are looking into this, and uh, we have another GRB from uh, 20th of uh, December 2014. Uh, similarly, we have a, some tail of a signal there, but it's not significant. We are not reporting about them. Neutrino follow-up is uh, something where 
something very important for us, and it's a big fun, uh, because since 2012, we joined the Gamma Ray follow-up uh, program, and then um, in the archive, we have uh, many measurements. In the meantime, I think uh, you can see um, on the map, I think what, what events were reported by IceCube, and some of them we are observing, so we allocate uh, time for observation of these events. And um, I would like to talk about, uh, to say a few words about this uh, IceCube event 17.09.22, the event measured on 22nd of September last year. And then uh, <clears throat> when, when the event was alerted, we immediately, not immediately, within um, uh, 34 hours, we directed our telescopes to, to this direction. We measured two hours, but the weather was bad, signal was not conclusive, and then I think a few years later, Fermilat um, sent an uh, astronomy telegram, and then uh, we reacted to that, and we directed also our telescopes, and then we measured significant signal from, uh, from an object, uh, which is very nearby to this one, and uh, this object name is uh, TXS uh, 0.0506. Um, I cannot talk much about it, but I assume that the speakers after me, um, Elisa Rasconi, I think uh, maybe um, she will talk more about it, and Francis Halsen. Uh, I'm coming close to the end of my presentation. So um, these, are, these are the uh, astronomy telegrams that we measured some signal from there, and then um, we are preparing some papers for uh, for this event, uh, I want to say that last last week we were celebrating 15 years of magic in La Palma. There was an interesting uh, Astrophysics Plus Magic Conference that some of the respective people sitting here participated. And uh, I'm coming close to the end of my presentation. I would say um, that magic is an excellent uh, telescope for transient physics. And uh, we, are, uh, we have a couple of hints for, for GRB detection, not significant. Um, gravitational waves, I think uh, we, are, uh, we will follow up them even more intensely in the future. And uh, neutrino follow-ups, I think this will uh, become, I think, uh, with, uh, in the next times, more and more intense issue. And then I'm sure we, we will want to spend uh, quite some time for this. And we are also interested in the um, um, FRBs, and then because we can measure also optical signal, we have a special central pixel, and then we can measure gamma ray signals. And then with this view graph, which is showing uh, the first 23-meter uh, diameter telescope next to two magic telescopes, I would like to finish my presentation. This telescope will be inaugurated uh, on October 10 in La Palma, and this is kind of uh, um, all the brother of magics, and there will be four telescopes built in this area in the next few years. So here's my summary. I will not read it. I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Very impressive results and also impressive improvement in the sensitivity going down to lower energy. That's very interesting. Uh, are there any questions? It's very important to maintain the, and improve the capability of fast uh, reaction. And uh, you mentioned the GRBs, for example, is a, of course a, an extreme example because there you have to react within a few tens of seconds or something like that. Uh, uh, let me mention something that just these days, for example, Cygnus X3, which is a very well-known source, is in a very peculiar state. We now understand these kind of systems in the sense that uh, it's not a random uh, kind of uh, emission. When they enter into some special states, after a few days maybe, or one week or whatever, they can uh, eject a, a, a very strong jet with plasmoids. And we are still missing a TV good coverage of that moment. So I hope that now Magic can participate just in the following days in this campaign. Yeah, I just want to thank you for, for the alert. And then, due to your alert, since yesterday we are measuring this. Okay, there's time maybe for another question. There is another question over there. Okay. There is a very simple idea to, com to combine uh, optics with general relativity. It relates with observation of, of the medical uh, mechanism of uh, the technology.
given directly. And uh, uh, just in order to popularize general terms for a wide uh, circles of uh, uh, population. Perhaps uh, there is some, some uh, industrial production of such a, a kind of Thank you very much. Okay. I, I think Felix has a question. This maybe the last one. Thank you. Yes, I would like to to know your opinion about uh, Signal Six One, the hint uh, detection as during uh, uh, an outburst with Fermi and Integral and so forth, and then the follow-up uh, observations. Uh, there were no similar results. So I think uh, um, historically it happened that once we um, published a paper uh, with a hint of a signal from Signu 6.1, uh, this hint was on the level of 4 sigma. And then I think uh, we, we had a big discussion in the collaboration before publication, very big discussion because typically this is not a good thing to publish for Sigma. Uh, in the end, I think it was published, but uh, we observed the source uh, in the subsequent years. Uh, we devoted more time, and we never saw the source uh, popping up. So I think uh, this stayed as a puzzle for us. Either it was a fluctuation, or maybe there was a, we were touching uh, just the tail of a signal. So I think we, we shall look into the future for more observations. This is all what I can say. Yes, but not we. I think we, 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 had, we just saw this hint. And then um, I think the problem with <laughs> astronomical sources is it's one flare. One, once it is flaring, and then if, if there is a, one instrument measuring in a given wavelength range, um, it's a relatively poor condition if the signal is not uh, significant. If there will be, for example, our colleagues, Veritas or Hayes would measure, then probably we can make a strong statement. But then, I mean, it uh, stays as a kind of puzzle for us. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm afraid we need to go to the next speaker. Thank you very much again. Yeah. <clears throat>